these people. Hi, John Vern with Parts and Quants back here again at Intersect at CMU. We just had a really great panel on artificial intelligence. Uh, a lot of really interesting thoughts. What really um, seemed really attractive to me is the three hour work day uh, because computers are going to do more than half of our work. Well, let's see how that really transpires, but it's a lovely thought, isn't it? Imagine going to work only two days a week and maybe three hours at a time. Hmm. Let's see how that really transpires. We're going to uh, bring on a bunch of people again. Uh, our first two guests are Mike Trick and Lori Weingart. Mike is the dean of Carnegie Mellon's campus in the Middle East. And then Lori is the interim provost of Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, the two of them share something in common. They were both uh, former associate deans who actually had a role in the planning of the Tepper Quad. So welcome, Mike and Lori. Hi. How are you? Thank you. Pleasure, you pleasure to have you both here. Pleasure to be here. So you two had been associate deans at the Tepper School during the planning process for this wonderful building, yes? You bet. And yeah. that is something you share together. That's right. We uh, were faculty member from the beginning since 1989 and then moved our ways up through the ranks, yep. moving into senior associate dean positions sequentially, simultaneously, working together very closely. So, so what's it like after all the years of work and planning to finally walk into this building and feel the buzz and the vibe here? What's it like? I will say it is unbelievably exciting because we had a vision, we had thoughts of what it could be, but um, when thoughts hit reality and you see people taking not only what we thought it could be, but then moving it beyond, even just in the first few weeks, it is just mm. extre extremely exciting. Right. Our perspectives are very complementary in terms of both looking at the role of the technology and the role of the people in the building. And so we work very closely together with the rest of the team to be able to think about how to design a building that both serves the faculty and the research and the technology that supports it in addition to how people interact in the space with our students, uh, collaborative spaces, uh, teaching spaces and so on. Now what were some of the early decisions that went in the planning of the building? Uh, that, that, that is going to make the magic happen, do you think? Well, so I will say it's a magnificent building, but we had constraints. We had space constraints and we had money constraints. And so uh, the big difficulty was to make certain that all of the space works all the time. And so it was very tempting to put in lots and lots of classrooms. Uh, but we didn't have space for all the classrooms, and so we had to work very hard to make certain we have exactly the number of classrooms we need. 24. And that is the number, okay? Uh, <laughs> 23 is too few, and 25 would be too many. Right. So 24 is the number. Right, and you're talking to our scheduler here, our master scheduler, who was ah. very focused on how we optimize the use of the classrooms given the demand. Now, on the flip side, I was very focused on well, how do we think about breakout rooms and teams collaborating and a big decision we had to make is do we put in a lot of breakout rooms right. or do we use furniture solutions in order to support the collaboration. That's we right. use the furniture solutions in order to do that and that was ideal and, and as we've been walking through the building in the past 24 hours we see our students sitting in these collaborative spaces moving the furniture around and having their meetings where we don't need to put up those walls. and. Uh, we can see the energy passing from group to group. And I think that's, in fact, the most exciting part about the building, is there are schools out there, uh, which I think are now old style, where they put in 30, 40, 50 breakout rooms, and that just isolates those students. And we, that's one thing Lori really wanted to stop us from doing. Don't isolate, create energy. Well, here's another big decision that was made. This is not merely a business school. It's in the heart of the campus and a very high percentage of the space in this building will be used by other departments and other colleges. Absolutely, and so in my role as provost, it's been very important for me to um, view that interaction and pull those people in. So that was a design feature from the very beginning. David Tepper started with that idea when he came in. He wanted to bring people into the business school. And of course, Bob Damon as dean embraced that. And then the rest of us, of course, what, who wouldn't want that? Well, I'll tell you, many 
business schools would not want that. <laughs> That's true. If you look at where business schools tend to be built, they're on the periphery of a campus, Indeed. and they tend to just bring in only their students. And what we wanted to do is something very different from that. That was David's vision, and that was something that we fully supported. So that's why you see this Simmons Auditorium. It will be used both by recruiters when they come in and, and present and do information sessions, but also for visitors who are coming in for admissions visits for across campus. Mm, so again, right. it goes back to Mike's point of how do you take a space, use it all the time, both by campus as well as by the business school. And you have a center for entrepreneurship that is university-wide, not merely in the business school or part of the business school. Uh, you have a, uh, a laboratory for improving learning. the quality of teaching mm -hmm. and learning. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. You have a virtual reality laboratory in here as well, which is a university-wide initiative. That's right. And so many of these, um, once the thought was to bring them in, that's when we started getting creative. How can we take advantage of this? And so how can our, our business students use the virtual reality laboratory? How right. can we take all the really fascinating stuff coming out of technology enhanced learning and change the way we do education within the building? And so it is really exciting having all these different groups in with us. It's going to change how we do things. And certainly I'm sure you've heard about the Schwartz Center for Entrepreneurship already. People have talked about it, um, I assume. Yes, indeed. Okay, so that's really an opportunity. You know, by design, entrepreneurship is interdisciplinary, of course, right? There's innovation, there's business models. That's true. Um, and so we have to pull these people together. That's what we do. Now, having a space inside the business school, intertwined with the educational mission, allows our students to, very, to bring, in the, bring in the technologists into the building to interact with our um, students and faculty who are standing up the new enterprises. And so if you've walked through that space, you'll see, like many innovation hubs, you have uh, rooms for startups to, like the more advanced groups, to close off their walls to have their workspace, the incubators, but you also have these nascent uh, groups forming at the tables all around the space. So as they mature, you can just think, look, watch their path through the center. Right, that's really cool. Yeah. Now, Lori, how did the university get to steal you from the business school <laughs> as interim provost? Um, <laughs> well, sir, uh, so there was, an, uh, there was a change in leadership where our interim provost was taking the role, our provost was taking the role as interim president, and he um, asked me if I would be willing to step in and serve as interim provost in support of that transition. And, and what was actually I, um, very logical is the role of our, we were both senior associate deans in the Tepper School. Right. And that's a combination pos pers uh, position of a department head and an associate dean. So both of us actually, and this is probably why we both got pulled into our positions, had the broader view um, of both an educational mission, how to run the, uh, the programs as well as oversee the faculty. And so being able to move into a provost position, for example, take, need, takes all those skill sets. Sure. So while what I did as a senior associate dean and Mike did before me uh, was very much a microcosm, it was complicated. It was a microcosm of what a provost has to do. Right. And now, Mike, you're the dean of Carnegie Mellon's campus in the Middle East. That's correct. And so at the same time Laurie was becoming interim provost, I was also pulled out then to become dean at our uh, campus in Qatar. And so uh, uh, this, there's only two senior associate deans in the business school, and we both came, left at exactly <laughs> the same time. So this left a real challenge for Bob Damon, but uh, he was very supportive. Uh, it is uh, a tremendous opportunity for me. Uh, it was we have an amazing campus out there, so it's small, but we bring together business and computer science just like we bring uh, them together here. Uh, it's all undergraduates, and the undergraduates and the faculty and the staff are amazing, and it has been a, an amazing experience out there. Taking a big campus like Carnegie Mellon and distilling it down into a much smaller, uh, but I think very effective campus I in the Middle East. How long has Carnegie Mellon been in the Middle East? We are about to celebrate our 15th year there. Wow. And so we're part of Education City, um, a, a vision from the leadership of the Qatari government. And so we are one of seven universities there. Uh, so Texas A&M does engineering, but we concentrate on business, information systems, uh, computer science, and biology. Wow. How many students do you have now? We have about 400. 
Wow, that's amazing. Um, and, and you have another campus uh, outside the United States as well, right? Uh, so we have Adelaide, uh, right. is the one you're referring to, yeah. yes, and so we, we, the Heinz School does public policy there. Right, right. so we have programs. Uh, I'll leave this to the provost, <laughs> she knows these things. <laughs> Actually, you, you may be thinking about our uh, master's programs in Rwanda. Ah, oh, that's uh, what I am right. thinking of, uh -huh. exactly. Yeah, absolutely, so right. we do, we have two master's programs in Rwanda. So for example, in Qatar, we have programs that are undergraduate. In Rwanda, their master's programs in engineering, in information technology, and electrical and computer engineering. And so very much focused on the Rwandan government's focus on information technology and being the center of information technology development for the continent. And so we, we, have, we work very closely with uh, bringing in students from the region from the, and, and giving education on site for those students. It's so let's go back to the Tepper Quad for a moment. Um, David Tepper, who uh, generously gave a third of the cost of this mm -hmm. new building, said this is more than a building, it's an idea. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you think the university is going to make use of this idea. Well, I, they're going to make it. Um, they're going to bring together the idea of bringing the whole campus together here. And so, uh, just like this conference is bringing together people from around the, the campus, every aspect of what we're doing, from the cafe, through the courses, through the entrepreneurship center, through uh, uh, technology enhanced learning, everything involves getting people together, mm. getting our students, getting our faculty together. And that, I think, is going to be the unifying idea, and that's going to make us fundamentally a different sort of business school. You, you've probably heard people talk about the boundaries being very permeable at Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. So when we arrived here, we, in 1989, um, that was the case then, it's still the case now. Walking into faculty offices, talking about research, I'm sure you probably did too. I actually met with Herb Simon and Alan Newell mm -hmm. to talk about my research in terms of negotiation and thinking about applying their theories of cognition to what I study. So, and the doors were always open and we could walk through. So that is the idea. And that was already existing at Carnegie Mellon. And even in the business school itself, uh, faculty no were not siloed by discipline. Right, right, that's right. So the marketing people weren't off in one corner, the finance in another, the accounting in another. And that is held in the new building. Yeah. Okay, we, we had the opportunity to assign offices in such a way we could have uh, sat by groups and the decision was made not to do so. And that is just so Tepper, so Carnegie Mellon. I love that. Yeah. All right. Mike, Lori, thank you so much for joining Thanks, us. It was a pleasure, really. Thank you, My John. My pleasure as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Okay. Now we have a special treat. We're going to have a professor of organizational behavior, uh, Anita Woolley, who is exploring the whole concept of collective intelligence. We'll find out from her what that really means. Hi there. Hi. I'm John. Hi, Hi Anita. Anita Woolley. So, yes, yeah, so I'm here at the Tepper School in the Organizational Behavior Group. I'm a faculty member. And you've come up a number of times in my conversations here. <laughs> because a lot of people are really excited about the research you're doing on collective intelligence. Define that for uh, me. So, uh, we define collective intelligence as the ability of a group to solve problems. And that group can consist of a group of people, but increasingly we're also looking at groups that incorporate machine intelligence. Plus you're looking at who forms the optimal group. What are the exactly. optimal members of a group? And what have you discovered? Yeah, so uh, we've been doing this work now for about eight years, and so that is a, a continually evolving answer. Um, initially, we were looking at human groups, and so uh, one of our first observations was that the proportion of women in the group was uh, associated with collective intelligence. It, that was not something did, we did, had set out to. Did you, in <laughs> fact, find that the best group has only one male <laughs> and everyone else is female? Yes. And How some can of that our, possibly uh, be? <laughs> Well, we find that um, in mixed gender groups um, that there is a higher uh, level of communication and when you have more women there's also greater equality of communication. Ah, and so, that's interesting. Yeah, so, um, and, and it turns out that actually it, one of the things that it rises when you have more women in the group is actually the social intelligence of the members. Um, so women on average uh, tend to possess higher levels of social skills that facilitate team collaboration, such My as social 
perceptiveness. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, whereas my my male neighbors refer to me as the raging feminist. So, um, so. When you add more women to the group, you essentially tend to, on average, raise the level of collaboration skill of the group members. And so that's a large, in large part, why having more women leads to higher collective intelligence. And what happens when you add machine learning, artificial intelligence, robots to the group? So we have been uh, exploring this in a variety of ways. Uh, so just to, to kind of give some context, a lot of work on AI done on this campus and other places um, focuses on what we call production technology. So technologies that help you do tasks better. But there's a whole other category of technologies that is, has even greater possibilities for collective intelligence. And that falls into uh, under the label of what we call coordination technologies, mm. which actually enhances the connections among the components of the system. System. And so, in essence, we find that collective intelligence is higher when the connections among the parts of the system are better, whether those parts are humans or robots. And so you can use some of these technologies to actually enhance the nature of the connections among the humans. And so you can do that in a variety of ways. So one of the problems in human systems is making sure everybody is putting enough effort into the work. True. And, uh, you know, if you're in a group, and especially if you're not sitting face to face, some people can slack off and you wouldn't be able to pick up on it. Well, you can incorporate technologies that actually might regulate the effort of members that might actually point out when maybe the effort is not equally distributed and thus enhance the uh, contribution of the lower performing members and raise the performance of the group overall. So that's one way that a coordination technology might enhance collective intelligence. And that's especially important in, in groups that work remotely. Yes, right? yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Another one would be in regulating communication. So we find uh, pretty regularly that groups that are dominated by one or a few people tend to be less collectively intelligent. But you can use coordination technologies to actually give the group feedback, even regulate the communication in such a way that can equalize the contributions of the members and enhance collective intelligence. And email happens not to be very good, right? Well, interestingly, we do find that a lot of the patterns that we observe in spoken communication do generalize to email and texting. So amount of communication, um, equality of communication are both are all important, whether it's spoken or written communication. And we do find that groups that are only emailing can achieve fairly high levels of collective intelligence. How do you bring all this into a classroom for MBAs? Oh, I, this is something we talk about all the time. Uh, and so I would say, uh, one thing of the many things that are unique about the Tepper School is that, you know, in our foundation is, are these notions of technology and artificial intelligence. Mm. And so whenever we're talking about any topics uh, in organizational behavior, technology is a, a critical component that we consider. So whether it, we're talking about hiring or performance management, it might be in other schools, they might have a separate segment where they say, okay, and then we'll talk about technology. But here we talk about technology in the context of all these topics, including teams. Right. And so how is it that you know you can get every team to operate like a high performing team? You know, how can you regulate members' behaviors? How can you give them feedback? How can you um, maybe take somebody who has a low level Level of social intelligence and raise their social intelligence by making the cues more apparent that they need to attend to uh, in other members or cueing them when they're writing an email that sounds really angry and is, is going to make the other person on the other side mad. That's the email that you have to sleep on. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Maybe machine will tell us, no, don't send this, please. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, and they do have those tools. I've played around with some of them. Uh, yeah, they're pretty interesting. Now, do you have any robots in your house? Oh, well, let's see. Yes. I mean, I have the kind of Google Home and I tried the like floor. Alexa, yeah, course. yeah. And then I tried the um, Roomba. Yeah, that didn't work very Come well. On, I, I had too Roomba. many thresholds and things. Oh, my like God. I love stuff. Roomba. I couldn't live without <laughs> Roomba anymore. Absolutely not. I've been waiting for a while for the self driving cars to really, you uh, know, be widely available because that would just take my carpooling woes away, you know, in terms of children and so on. So, that so would let be me great. ask you a question that is kind of at the heart of what this is all about. Mm -hmm. uh, you are a professor in the business school. Yeah. Do you do joint research with uh, colleagues in other schools here? Oh, yeah. Okay. A, a lot. 
Yeah. Give me one good example. So I collaborate with Laura Dabish, who's over in the Human Computer Interaction Institute. Uh, and we've been looking at systems that pick up on uh, physiological cues that uh, transmit between people who are collaborating effectively and achieving a high level of collective intelligence. And so, so, we, so does that mean face recognition? So we find, for example, that uh, if you, even if you're collaborating via Skype, if you mimic the facial, uh, if you achieve high synchrony and facial expressions that you have a higher level of collective intelligence and so there are systems now that can sort of emphasize what people's facial expressions are and we're experimenting on whether or not that would actually enhance this facial expression synchrony so you're essentially measure, measuring engagement and listening skills uh-huh right? and attention right so if I'm attending very closely to what you're saying and if you're happy and expressing something happy and I'm also smiling then I am giving you a higher quality of attention than if I'm thinking about something else and I'm frowning at the time that you're happy of course if you're always nodding that may not be as convincing <laughs> I don't know I don't know maybe <laughs> but um, so and then we also find the same with vocal pitch that um, you know when you have synchrony and vocal pitch even if you don't have it access to video uh, that teams are more collectively intelligent when they have greater synchrony so that's wow. that's one project that I'm involved in but there are others <laughs> I'm sure there are well listen thank you so much for coming by my that's pleasure really fascinating stuff thank you love it all right all right Bye-bye. So we have uh, a couple more guests before we go back to the stage and the uh, presentation on blockchain. We have, oh, I'm loving you for your three-hour workday. I love it too. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have here? Uh, Liliana Resor. Great. So what do you think the big takeaway was uh, from the artificial intelligence panel? Well, so I would say... Uh, AI is going to change the world and most importantly what we call work and uh, as uh, you've already heard me on this I think a three hour work day three days a week or two days a week is probably going to happen in future people are going to love that thank you you are you you were I think the best optimist on the panel today I am, I am an optimist on AI. And, su and surprisingly, the executive at, at IBM, I would have to say on your panel, uh, sounded the most alarms about artificial intelligence. Uh, so this is, um, so they're probably looking at short term at this time. Yes. Um, uh, and in, and sh in the short term, there'll be some disruption. Yes. And it will be uncomfortable for people. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where uh, I think they have to because it's an organization working at and they need to care about what happens uh, in the short term, what, how do they train their employees, where do they hire people and so on. That disruption is going to be major for them, as with any other company. And you're an optimist too, are you not? I am an optimist. And uh, I actually I am involved with the blockchain panel, so the next panel, uh, where we'll discuss the, uh, dis for the disruptive and transformative potential of the blockchain. I can't wait to hear about that. A lot of people are worried about blockchain, are they not? Well, I think in a positive way, because blockchain could transform the entire business society in a positive way. It's a complete, um, it's creating new industries. And to the extent that we all get involved and help steer it in the right direction, then it could be really uh, create very positive effects for society and businesses. How, how do these two technologies collide, AI and blockchain? Are th they're not really one and the same, are they? They are not, and that is very, a very interesting question because I'm also the founder of uh, Suprafin, uh, which uh, has, is creating a portfolio management platform that levers blockchain and artificial intelligence. Both are disruptive technologies that together can be utilized to uh, create um, a new innovations that help the world and help the crowd really uh, benefit from things that they couldn't benefit in the past. Right. You know, one of the takeaways for me today is that AI is here and now, and we may not even realize it. I mean, the fact that it's core to the Facebook platform, for example, uh, or that it's instrumental in how uh, Amazon goes about its business. So we're already experiencing the effects of these technologies, and we're not fully cognizant of the fact that these things are working in the background and making life more interesting, more efficient, and also, um, in some ways, more troubling. Yes. So, so exactly, like, uh, as you said, AI is everywhere. 
If you have a smartphone and you have Siri on that, that's AI for you. Right. Uh, if you put a picture on Facebook and when Facebook starts tagging those pictures, it's AI for you. It is making life really well, but uh, really better. Uh, as I said, one thing we all also have to uh, take into account is uh, the societal impact in the long run. That's um, where we have challenges with AI, and uh, I think we should be, uh, policymakers need to step up, understand technology. They cannot make decisions just by uh, reading sometimes from the media what AI can do, which is a lot of times magic. Yes. If you understand this technology, you can do uh, really well. And I think at CMU, uh, some of the people have been asking me after the panel, uh, is are the policy guys talking with the technologists? And if you look at it, at Tepper School, we have technologists as well as policy guys. Heinz College is fully policy and technology. Then we have engineering and public policy. All of us get together to talk about these things. And uh, that's what I think needs to happen. Uh, now, going forward. Now, one point made in your panel I found really interesting was this. You can't fully extrapolate the future from the past when you're dealing with technology. So the thinking is, okay, every other technological change that was in fact disruptive to society, um, we got over, yes. we transitioned, we figured it out. But now the pace of change has accelerated to the point where retraining, re-education of people, uh, taking care of the dislocation that will occur, may not be as easy as it was to, in the past. Yes. What is your take on that? Um, well, I think it is the roles of the universities to embrace and educate uh, the population so that they are ready for these new technologies. So we have to accelerate education as well. We have to accelerate education. And uh, in the case, for example, so artificial intelligence to one extent is a bit older technology than blockchain, correct? Blockchain is a much newer technology. And uh, yet I see, um, it's, so it's fantastic to see, for example, Carnegie Mellon creating this uh, blockchain initiative to embrace uh, this new technology, to educate people, to bring the alumni together and to create some sort of a global hub and where uh, Carnegie Mellon could be like a thought leader trying to steer to the right direction to the industry. So that is uh, fantastic. Now, I don't want you to be a fortune teller, but I want you to tell me if you can, or predict at least, uh, what's going to be the single application, the earliest application of blockchain that most people are going to realize and be affected by? Um, that is an interesting question. Well, first, uh, Bitcoin was the first application actually. Uh, actually, block, uh, uh, blockchain is the underlying technology of uh, Bitcoin. The other one I think is going to be um, a su Suprafin, which is going to, which is my company, which is going to bring uh, vetting to eliminate fraud and scams from um, the ventures that are issuing tokens globally to, to raise funds. And so that we can bring this cryptocurrency industry to the hands of the people. Uh, so that they can also benefit from this industry. Because right now, uh, it's in the hands of people who don't want others to see their transactions, by and large. Yes? Well, uh, there's a lot of speculation about, about that, but uh, I think it's good to focus on the positive things of, yes. of something and how can we benefit, uh, particularly because it could really be, blockchain can be really be transformative for the positive in terms of, uh, for example, the concept of ICOs, where a venture from anywhere in the world, let's say a venture in South Africa, can raise capital from the global crowd by using this concept of crowd sales, of tokens, or mm. ICOs, while in the past, a venture in South Africa will never be able to raise a lot of capital because there's not a lot of capital there in Africa, right. South Africa. Sure. And so it has amazing potential, but we, from the, um, the people that believe on it, that want to do great things and that have the skills, they've had to get, get involved so that we can steer this in the right direction. Okay, next five years, the single biggest application of artificial intelligence that, that's going to affect the most people. What would it be? So, uh, that's a tough question. Uh, autonomous vehicles? Uh, autonomous vehicles are already happening. If you are in Pittsburgh, you have already seen these um, self-driving Ubers. This will happen, I think, we'll have fully connected homes. We will be controlling most of the things with our cell phones. That probably is going to happen. And probably jobs. We'll be working three hours a week. 
<laughs> <laughs> I only hope you're right for a lot of people. But I love to work, so yes. I don't want any three-hour week. I so, want the 12-hour 12, 12 day, seven-day-a-week a job. <laughs> Let me see what is going to happen eventually on this. Is I'm thinking the way we will pay employees is not going to be based on the hours they work. It will be based on the tasks they complete. Uh, you want to work seven hours a day to fix those, to do that task? Up to you, be my guest. You get the same salary to do the task as somebody who does it in two hours. Well, I love that thinking. Uh, <laughs> let's hope that maybe for some people who don't want to work that hard, yeah. uh, that comes true. Uh, and for people who want to work hard, the yes. computer will do a lot of the routine tasks that you do now, free up the time to be more creative and to do more quality and meaningful work. Yes. Thank you so exactly. much for joining Thank us. You. All right. A pleasure. A pleasure, and I'm looking forward to your panel. Thank you. All right. So, do we have another guest in store here? No, we don't. Yes, we do. See? Hi there. Hi. I'm Lauren Sala. Nice to meet Hi. You. I loved your panel. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. It was a great opportunity to uh, remind the people out there about the uh, history of uh, AI here at Tepper and uh, our interdisciplinary approach to uh, some of the problem it raises. That's true. Now you have to be an optimist, as most of the people here are. <laughs> Although are you I'm not? an economist, yes. I, I, yes, actually, yeah. <laughs> even as an economist <laughs> yeah. of the dismal art. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what were your takeaways from the panel? Well, I think they were raising uh, a lot of interesting points, in particularly the uh, impact on the workforce. Yes. Uh, I was particularly interested on the uh, social aspect of AI because that seems to be one of the frontier where uh, uh, humans really have an advantage. So in terms of thinking about what jobs we may have in the future and what are some skills that we might uh, give our uh, uh, students, that seems to be a, an area that is uh, uh, important to invest in. And, and, and to that end, one panelist noted that you know, the jobs that are going to diminish mm -hmm. in the economy yeah. are those that require uh, little social interaction, yeah. and the jobs that are going to grow yeah. are those that require greater social skills. You yeah. agree with that? No, yeah. Uh, uh, the research shows that that seems indeed to be the case. Uh, even, uh, uh, this is something we've seen in the data even up to now, uh, it's true that STEM areas are the ones that we see a lot of wage growth, right. but in particular when it's a STEM area that is uh, connected with a social component. I always tell this to my students uh, in my MBA class because this is really what they are uh, uh, getting out from their, from their degrees in some sense. So, um. how, how do MBAs receive the, the notion of AI the AI technology and, and AI revolution. I mean, there was one person who, I think it was you in fact, who okay. said, my MBA students ask me all the time, yeah. will robots replace yeah. me? Yeah, well, one of my answers I, <laughs> uh, I would give them is like, you know, actually it's, it's hard to know because we have so little data. So I don't know if it's my prompt to say we should hire more economists because we need them to uh, collect more data, but it's, uh, it's, it's uh, where we are now. We have a lot of questions and little uh, data to provide the answers. And actually, you, I think you're onto something here. I think more threatening than the technology is the uncertainty. No, oh, for sure. Then. We I mean, just don't know. It, no, exactly. We don't know if this new technological revolution will actually create more jobs, make our jobs more mm -hmm. meaningful, and actually easier. Right. Or will we have jobs? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, so that is sort of the dilemma, the uncertainty that comes with this new disruptive age. Yeah. And this technology. is what uh, introduces anxiety in a lot of people out there. You know, what is going to happen? You know, the past is not necessarily a good guideline for, you know, our recent uh, next future. So you are going to be uh, having a new home here. Yeah, yes. You already is. moved in. We are already teaching in here. Uh, What's it feel like to be a professor at the school right now? Uh, it feels great. There is uh, a lot of energy uh, uh, everywhere. You know, students are really spending a lot of time, and these are not only our students, there is, uh, as you walk, you see people working on a variety of different problems, clearly from around campus, uh, coming here and uh, just being in the space. It, it, it provides a really uh, powerful energy. Great. Lawrence, thank well, you. Thank you very much. You did a great job on your oh, panel. Well, thank I you really so much. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. We are Thank at so Intersect much. at CMU. The last panel is now taking the stage. Uh, they're going to talk about blockchain, and I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. And then I'm going to be back uh, with the dean of the Tepper School of Business, Bob Damon, uh, and then we'll sign off for the, for the day. I hope uh, you've enjoyed all of the festivities so far. Uh, there's a bit more to come, and I can't wait. See you soon.